David Peterson, the creator of Mouse Guard, and welcome to Creator Commentary for the second series of Mouse Guard, collectively called Mouse Guard Winter 1152. This episode will cover issue one, or chapter one, when it was collected into a hardcover edition. Please feel free to follow along in your copy of the story in either issue form or from the hardcover as I talk about the behind-the-scenes details, art notes, and my headspace as I go page by page and panel by panel. Also, a fair warning, there will be spoilers if you have not yet read this or the rest of the Mouse Guard series. I started outlining the winter series in the spring of 2007 and was drawing pages by June of that year. I wanted the follow-up series to fall to be more personal, for me to work on my storytelling and my characterizations. Setting it in the winter was a bit of a novelty visually, but it also tied into a larger theme of being the winter of Kalanaw's life, something I'll get into in later issues. This was my first series to work on full-time after I left the architectural antique store I was working for when I did fall. Cover. The cover to this issue started as just costume designs for each character in their winter garb. I wanted the characters to be more protected from the elements, but without losing their cloak colors and recognizability that each character had, I'd established in fall. I also liked the idea of giving them snowshoes made out of acorn caps and other found objects. Kenzie, Sadie, and Kellanaw all got hoods. Liam and Saxon went without. Kellanaw here is standing alone, leading the pack on the front cover, while the others are behind him on the back cover. In some ways, I was emulating the fall covers of having only a single character per front cover, and while I did later covers with a single character, this was the last time I did it due to formula. The trail of Kalanaw's pipe smoke are again my thumbprints, like I did in the fall issues, and his axe is wrapped in cloth. I worried about how to have the secret identity of the legendary black axe roaming around with guard mice. I thought wrapping it may help, so it isn't so easily seen. But that also sort of doesn't make sense. Inside front cover. For this series, I stopped using issue titles. Titles turned out to be confusing with Fall, where some people would ask when Belly of the Beast, the title of issue one, Issues number two was coming out. I decided also to have shorter introductions, opening crawl text, and to fill that extra space with larger spot illustrations of frozen nature and poems. The spot illustration here of withering berries was meant to set the tone of the mice dangling out there in the cold. The background of this piece has cross-hatched lines in the negative space, leaving the open space in between to imply more branches behind. The poem itself is an eight-line A-B-A-B rhyming structure. It's pretty straightforward in its meaning. The author, though, is Roybin the Scribe, something I'll talk more about later in this issue. Page 1. For this series, I didn't need the first panel of each issue to act like a title and credits block, so I could play more with page 1 panel layouts in winter than I had in fall. For the falling snow, and this applies to every piece of falling snow you'll see in the six-issue series, I'd place a piece of white paper over the finished inked art, and while on a light box, I'd dab dots of ink with a cotton swab for the falling snow. Doing it on the light box allowed me to avoid certain areas like a mouse's eye or mouth, or anything else I wanted to avoid. When I'd scan the original art for the page, I also had to scan the snow sheet for that page, and then digitally manipulate those black dots to be the falling white snow, panels one through three. To open the issue, I really wanted to push the magnitude of cold winter landscape, of the isolation and the, the oppressiveness that it can bring. By panel three, I needed to add in some mice, but I did so by having them in silhouette, with the snow creating an almost visual fog. Dr. Zhivago was certainly an inspiration for these snow scenes. Panel 4. To take advantage of the vertical panel shape, I decided to continue on with Liam as a tree, or in this case some kind of thicket or bush, scout, like he was in issue 1 of Fall. I remember trying to play with the movement of the wind, and that his fur and ears would react against the cold breeze, 
as well as his snowshoes, which he's taken off for climbing. And right away, his comment about the storm getting worse implies that they've already had concerns about the weather so far on this mission, and that we have the first obstacle for them in this issue. Page 2, Panel 1, our first view of the five-member patrol. I knew I wanted Sadie to be more involved in winter than in fall, and Kellenaw was integral to the story I wanted to tell. Uh, Turns out, Sadie was too. But it meant having a lot more mice to try to fit into scenes, where I was normally only drawing three main characters per panel maximum before. Sadie's line addressing Kenzie directly was an intentional way to start to establish a connection between the two. Also, asking him about the plan was to reestablish Kenzie's role and chief attribute as a wise leader. Panel 2. A map. Not only does the addition of a map instantly add something to a fantasy world, but I'd taken the time to know where the mice were and where they were heading, and I figured some fans who had the map handy from the fall book would also enjoy seeing and knowing as well. The corners of the map are meant to be weighed down with stones, even though the wind is trying its best to blow it away. And Kenzie's dialogue tells the reader that we're going to Spruce Tuck. Panel 3. To avoid a talking head or reaction panel of the mice to the idea that the snow-covered plain was unappealing, I opted to just show the cold landscape again. Page 3. This page is a 90-degree rotation of the previous page's layout. Panel 1. Kalanoff suggests burrowing a tunnel under the snow to get across the plain. This is something real mice do in the wild, something I first learned of in the movie Never Cry Wolf, where a researcher in the Canadian Arctic is trying to figure out what a wolf population there survives on a diet of. When the researcher observes them pouncing on the snowdrifts and realizes the wolves are hearing mice underneath the surface of the snow and catching them. Panel 2. Kenzie wisely gives an order for the patrol to go down into the snow tunnel in a particular order. Establishing this order is important because I have to draw them consistently that way, but also because it's so ingrained in me as a role player that the players need to establish the smartest order, but also so that if there is a random event, the game master can determine what happened to whom. This bird's eye shot of them with us some distance away was my way of breaking up the visuals with the medium shots at their eye level, and also to help the reader get a sense again of how small and vulnerable mice are. Panel 3. Saxon being still above ground here was to help establish the sense of space for the cutaway I attempted here. I also like the idea that Saxon has more trepidation of being down there than the rest of them, something that comes up again on the next page. Page 4. This page has an odd panel layout compared to my usual, but I knew I wanted lots of quick shots with a resolution by the end of the page. Panel 1. Saxon certainly doesn't like being down in that tunnel, and his line about being down here for ages was meant to show not only his impatience, but also to imply to the reader that this must be taking a long time. That it was quite a distance to burrow. Panel 2. Liam is enamored with Kellenaw, and their relationship is a major theme of this arc. It picks up the mentor-mentee thing I suggested at the end of fall in the epilogue. Panel 3. Kenzie references a fox leaping down on them, like the wolves did in Never Cry Wolf, but it is something you can easily find video of foxes doing in the snow as well. For these first three panels, I used a mouse from the last panel in the next panel to help the idea of the order of the mice and establish the space between them. Panel 4. Saxon's wordless response is to grab his sword and look above him. He's ready to fight a predator at the mere mention of its name. Panels 5 and 6. Kellenaw's exclamation point suggests he's found something, and Liam's question mark substitutes a huh or a what? I like using punctuation marks and word balloons for Mouse Guard, as it implies subtle sounds that are not overly wordy. Hey, Kelena, what did you find there? Panel 7. The last panel shows the lineup again in this cutaway snow tunnel. Where did all the snow go, you may ask? I don't know. Perhaps it was just fluffy snow that was compacted under their paws, but they are finally, finally after one page, through to Spruce Tuck.
Page 5, Panel 1. To establish where Spruce Tuck is, I showed a pulled-back view of the pine tree, and how the base of it is snow-blanketed, and how our patrol's tunnel has arrived to it. Panel 2. Here we get a better view of those gates. When designing the pattern for those gates, I only drew half of them, and then digitally copied and mirrored the other half to make them symmetrical. Kenzie asks to see the governor of Spruce Tuck. In fall, I listed the top job in Barkstone as mayor. Not sure if I had a reason for calling the city leaders by different titles for any other reason than making them different, you know, so that each location had its own customs, laws, governing norms, etc., which was something that we played with in the role-playing game later on. The only other explanation I can come up with is that Spruce Tuck, being more science-based as a city, may consider that to govern is a better example of leadership than what a title like mayor might imply. Panel 3. Because I wanted to give Spruce Tuck a real reveal, I wanted to first only give a hint of the aesthetic in the background of this reaction panel of the mice all looking up and save the reader's view for a page turn. Page 6. I'd done a video about the model I built of Spruce Tuck that I used to help me illustrate this splash page. My idea was, what if Brian Froud designed the Ewok village? The center trunk of Spruce Tuck is a hollow shaft, and the mice live and work in dwellings carved out of the remaining wood nearing the bark. A series of concentric balconies with elevators and ladders make moving throughout the city possible. Page 7, Panel 1. The mouse who answered the gate has brought the governor to see our heroes. I tried to continue the aesthetic motif of the hinges and door trim into the spruce tuck mouse clothing. Or at least the city workers like the gate mouse, the governor, and the elevator operator seen in the back. These mice also happen to be the only spruce tuck mice we ever see. Why? Because I didn't want to draw more mice when I already had five main characters needing to talk to a sixth mouse. Though, if I was George Lucasing a special edition, I'd add more townsfolk. Panel 2. Though Kalanaw is gesturing with the note, and for many reasons he's the mouse with the most seniority of the patrol, I wanted to make sure Kenzie is actually leading the mission. So he's explaining to the governor all about the summit as well as their supply needs. Liam and Sadie are taking off their snowshoes and placing them in a pile with the others. Panel 3. Other than as a beat, I'm not sure why I didn't do more with this panel establishing the governor has taken them to some upper level of spruce tuck and into a room. Though, I guess that's reason enough for this panel. Though I wish I'd done more signage or some kind of symbol outside the door to imply where it was they had gone. Panel 4. I based this room on a photo of a wine cellar I found online. I thought the curves were interesting and fit with the look of spruce tuck more than a room with racks with lots of hard right angles. And the story needing them to be all but empty was a lucky break for me, as drawing and coloring all the bottles of filled racks would have taken more time. Page 8. I wanted to first point out that on this six-panel page, the first, fourth, and fifth panels are all tight crops of objects which help to break up the mouse heads talking, all the dialogue, and to tell stories with the pictures of those objects. Panel 1. Lily Grove Coins. In fall, I didn't think I'd done enough to push the idea that all the cities are different, that they aren't a united kingdom in many ways. What links them is being inside the scent border, being populated by mice, and the guard being the linking connections between them all. So showing another town's coin gave me the opportunity to draw some cool objects that had a world-building quality to them, but also to show, in the next panel, that one town may not normally accept another town's money. I purposely picked a mouse city a long distance away from Spruce Tuck. Panel 2. As I said, the coin wouldn't normally be accepted, but the governor is willing to make an exception for these guard mice. The background here wasn't too hard for me to draw, just referencing the wine cellar photo I'd found, but... Panel 3. For this more ambitious, top-down shot, I needed more. 
So I built a quick model of the room out of cardboard to frame the floor and the curved shape of the wall, and then Bristol board that I'd stenciled the wine rack openings to with a marker, and then glued that to the curved wall shape. Unfortunately, this model no longer exists. It bit the dust, and I didn't build it to last. Panel 4. The Spruce Tuck Elixir. I remember doing some research on herbalistic uses of pine or spruce to incorporate that into the medicine the mice were collecting for Lockhaven, and read that parts of a spruce can be used to make spruce beer, and for some medicinal uses, none of which really would cure the mouse they're trying to help back at Lockhaven, but let's suspend some disbelief. I designed these labels and printed them out and taped them onto real beer bottles and photographed them to get the font to wrap and curve properly when I inked them. Panel 5. I also printed the note, using a font, and folded it into quarters and then held it to get just the right look for this panel too. Instead of having the characters explain the summit, more talking heads, I figured I could crop the note from Gwendolyn in a way that still told the story itself. Panel 6. And in case the fifth panel wasn't clear, the governor reiterates the important part, with Kenzie giving more details. Having this panel with the governor still up several levels and the guard mice down by the entrance was a way to help bridge between the scene in the wine cellar-like room and getting our heroes back outside. Page 9. If memory serves, this page and the next page were added, though I can't remember if I was two pages short or if I cut down a scene later to make room for this. They were added to help add some character interaction between Saxon and Kenzie, and to give a little more space between Spruce Tuck and the Owl. Seeing the mice exit Spruce Tuck was something missing when it jumped from what is page 8 to what is now page 11. Panel 1. Like I said, the exit scene here felt necessary, and it gave me a chance to sow some discord between Saxon and Kenzie. Saxon, of course, wants to push through the night. He also references another city on the map, Copperwood. Panel 2. And Kenzie reasonably suggests that everyone could use the rest. And then he mentions that it was Kalanaw who suggested making camp. And other than it's in his nature and I wanted to build up some conflict, I'm not sure why Kalanaw making the advisement has set Saxon off. But he calls Kenzie's leadership title into question. Panel 3. It almost sounds like Saxon here is jealous of Kelena, and I never meant that f to be the case. I meant for him to just be skeptical, and skeptical of everyone else's sudden faith in the old fur. And Kenzie delivers, as he would, a very calm and rational explanation of his viewpoint on Kelena and his own leadership. Panel 4. I chose a top-down view for this panel not just to switch up the camera angle, but also to show that there is enough distance between the other mice and Saxon and Kenzie for us to believe that their conversation is mostly private. Panels 5 and 6. The only way to get this dialogue in panel 5 to be understood as Saxon saying it is him adding Ken's at the end, and the same with Sax at the end of panel 6 for Kenzie. Unfortunately, I think the abbreviated nicknames comes off as condescending rather than just familiar, the way they address each other just casually. Kelena not being the type that likes to be led or asks to be followed is something I think I came up with as a way to describe him to either Mark Smiley or something I said during an interview. No matter where I said it first, I liked it and broke it into two for each mouse to have a viewpoint on. Page 10, panel 1. The debate continues, and unfortunately with Saxon speaking first, being on the left, and there being no room for his dialogue, I had to break his word balloon tail behind Kenzie. Saxon's loyalty being not just with Lockhaven, but Gwendolyn, specifically, is a tell. Panel 2. A closer shot of the two, always trying to vary that camera, with Saxon referencing the events of Fall to suggest they'd been duped before. And Kenzie carries the reference further to mention Midnight by name, and to prove to Saxon how carefully paranoid accusations must be treated, as they can easily be applied to red-cloaked mice. I didn't intend at all to mean that Kenzie actually believes Saxon is a threat to the guard, beyond his nature to get himself into trouble. 
but I wanted to showcase the kind of moments between Jesse Glenn and I from our youth where I was overreacting, and he puts a very fine point on his logical rebuttal that put me in my place. Panel 3. By panel 3, it was important to resolve the argument without too much turmoil, and Saxon saying he will always follow Kenzie's lead is a fact and a lie. His nature gets the better of him for this to be completely true. I was also addressing some headcanon here that, in my mind, Saxon had once prior been offered to lead his own new patrol, separate from Kenzie's, but he declined the promotion in order to stay with Kenzie, free of making leadership choices, but also partnered with his friend. Page 11, panels 1 through 3. Over these three panels, the camera barely moves, but I wanted the owl not to be obvious in panel one and perhaps even in panel two, but to be mistaken for tree bark. But by panel three, Kellanaw is the mouse to announce that he knows they are being hunted by an owl. Page 12, panel one. The page turn reveals the great horned owl. Originally, when I was only talking about winter while wrapping up fall, or perhaps the small break in between, fall and winter, the threat was going to be a pair of hawks. That way, one could die during this encounter, and the other could come back to stalk the mice and kill Kellanaw in the end. But both Mark Smiley and my wife independently thought an owl was a better choice, and I listened. Panel 2. The camera here is meant to be close to the owl's point of view, or a zoomed-in version of it, as Kellanaw gives the order. Wait, Kellanaw giving the order? Is Kenzie the one leading this mission? And then Kenzie amends his own command on. Panel 3. Sadie wasn't originally going to be the one to have the sling. In my earliest outline, it was Kellanaw who would sling rocks at the owl, but I liked it better for Sadie once I got started. Since I'd already established daggers as her main weapon in fall, I suddenly liked the idea of giving her some range. Panel 4. And with another object close-up, I wanted to switch the camera again, show how the sling worked. It always irks me when people call this thing a slingshot instead of a sling. And give Sadie some bold talk. Page 13. This page's panel layout is a mirror of the previous page. Panel 1. It had been a few panels since we'd seen the owl, so I wanted to re-establish that it's there and isn't planning on moving. Panel 2. An action shot of Sadie spinning the sling, and also showing that it's a sling and not a sling shot. Panel 3. And the stone hits the branch where the owl's foot had been, implying that Sadie missed, but... Panel 4. Sadie is not boasting or lying here. She hit precisely where she meant to, and she's loading another stone. Page 14, panel 1. The owl may or may not understand her words, but sees the stone being re readied and swoops down to make a kill. Panel 2. Instead of showing the same twirling sling movement as the last shot, I chose to show the moment after the one line is released, and the stone is already on its trajectory. Panel 3. Sadie does not miss. Panel 4. The owl's bloodshot eye was my way of showing some color in a winter book, but mainly it was to show a mark on the owl in such a way that when it comes back later in the series, we know that this is the same very angry owl. Page 15. Panel 1. Kenzie's dialogue is meant to be read first, complimenting Sadie. Then Sadie's response was to add more to her backstory of isolation at the Frostic Outpost. Saxon, of course, is disappointed he didn't get to fight. And this allows Kelona to have his own mantra, one that Gary Witta used thematically in his draft of the Mouse Guard screenplay. Panel 2. And just to make it clear that the fight is over and the sun is setting, this panel shows the owl flying off into the darkness. Page 16. Panel 1. I left a lot of room at the top of this panel to show an empty and darkening sky, just in case the two-thirds of a page panel on the last page didn't tip readers off. I left Kellanaw out of this panel because I knew he was going to have dialogue in panel two. Kellanaw lets them all know that because owls are nocturnal, they are not yet safe. 
but that he is prepared to go with his own recommendation to make camp. Panel 3. But Kenzie has made up his own mind to travel on. Is it because of his conversation with Saxon? I never really resolve why, but I think their talk, coupled with the idea that they are not safe with the owl hunting, pushes Kenzie to want to keep moving. Page 17. This page's panel layout is a 180-degree rotation of the previous page. Panel 1. An establishing shot of Lockhaven, blanketed in snow. Unfortunately, I didn't make it clear that the area we can see of Lockhaven is actually a cutaway, and that the entire place is buried. Gwendolyn's narration here helps me explain that the guard don't normally go out on patrol in winter, that there is less need to do so, and that it's obviously dangerous. She also brings up the consequences of fall and midnight's effect on them still. Panel 2. This stained glass window design is based on a pinup I received from fellow Michigan comic creator Jane Irwin. Though the pinup wasn't published until later in the winter series, I wanted to incorporate it into the architecture of Lockhaven. Gwendolyn's narration continues about how unusual it is for Lockhaven to be empty in winter, that sending out patrols is an abnormality. Though, truth be told, the math doesn't completely add up for the number of guard and the ones I account for out on this mission. Unless many are permanently stationed in cities around the territories, but they'd also then have to not be in Spruce Tuck, or we would have seen them. Panel 3. Here we are in Lockhaven's library. I built a very quick model for this location, one that I hope to not only do a video of, but rebuild and improve upon someday. The stained glass is the showpiece of the far wall. Gwendolyn's narration mentions Rand's position of tracking patrols has been taken over by a quartermaster, Landra. She is meant to be the representation of my sister-in-law, Kim, as a mouse of the guard. The other mouse with Gwendolyn here is Roybin, and I'll take a break from talking about this page specifically to talk about him. Arkea wanted to run a contest for Mouse Guard in the pages of previews, that's the catalog where new issues and products are announced and can be ordered by comic shops each month. Entries were to be of a new guard mouse with a drawing of the character and a backstory and description of them. The grand prize was to have that character featured in the pages of Mouse Guard Winter 1152. Lori Johnson of Indiana was the winner with Roybin and his beetle companion and writing supply holder, Connell. To help weave Roybin into Mouse Guard beyond appearing in a few panels, I attributed all the poems at the start of each issue to him. Now back to the page. Before we even see Connell, I tried to establish the connection between Roybin and the Beetle with the dialogue here. Page 18, panel 1. After a page turn, we meet both Landra and Connell as they descend the library stairs to meet Gwendolyn and Roybin. I like that while Lockhaven is a stone fortress, that there are some areas, like the library, where even the stairway is carpeted. Panel 2. Landra is able to show Gwendolyn and Roybin, who I guess is more than just a scribe, but a trusted advisor here, where she anticipates the patrols to be, starting with Kenzie's. Panel 3. We get another view of the map, maps, showing the three main patrols out collecting supplies and delivering summit invitations. Many of the mice listed and the two other patrols are based on friends and family of mine, but the ones I'll make note of right now are Bastion for Jeremy Bastion, Delvin for Nate Pride, the name means proud friend, and Elemis, an anagram of Smiley for Archaea founder Mark Smiley. All three of these gentlemen also contributed stories in Legends of the Guard Volume 1. The last bit of dialogue is supposed to help bolster the loss of time we know Kenzie's patrol had near Copperwood, as well as to foreshadow that while they w are expected to be the first to arrive back, they will actually be the last to return home. Page 19. This page's panel layout is 180 degree rotation of the last page. Panel 1. Here we get a better look at the relationship of the stairs to the library. I always want to do a good job of establishing a sense of space, especially with architecture, but sometimes it has to be pieced together over several panels. And Gwendolyn ups the stakes here, that this could turn out worse than the worst thing I've ever mentioned from the series. 
which I think was an exaggeration on my part to make this book's outcome as important or more important than fall or even the winter slash weasel war. Panel two, new architecture location. While I don't get around to establishing specifically where this is until the end of the next issue, this is the Lock Haven Apothecary. And a mouse is resting in a niche, presumably there for care. While I don't mention him until the next panel, all the visual cues of his cloak and shield are there for the readers to know that it's Rand. I tried to fill the room with details of medieval medicine, herbology, and folklore. Panel 3. As Gwendolyn names Rand for the reader who appears to be getting worse, she also introduces us to the apothecary practitioner, Abigail. Page 20, panel 1. Abigail gives us the bad news about Rand. His leg is worse than it was in fall, and he has a fever. He won't last more than one night. I'm going to be honest here. I'm pretty sure I didn't have the plan yet for the subplot about Abigail that develops in issue 2. I have nothing about it in any of the notes or outlines, and I don't remember her being some kind of baddie for the series initially. The only tip-off I, that I might have planned for that is her name. For reasons not worth going into, that name was always meant to be tied to a villain. Panel 2. Gwendolyn sits by Rand's side and tries to comfort herself as much as him with her assurances of his pulling through and Kenzie's patrol. I resisted the urge to make a model of this room, despite having seen it from four different angles in this issue and a few more later in this series. Oh, and a note, the mouse skull on the table is not meant to be an omen of evil. It was a common practice for medieval medics to have a skull on their desk for study. Though in this instance, it also happens to work as a mood setter and a foreshadowing of Abigail. Page 21, panel 1. Subtle navigational lighting reference, but the patrol was headed north all night, and the sun rises in the east, and it casts shadows on those tiny trees and mice to the west. I put Kellen on the lead not only to echo the cover of this issue, but also to reference his outpacing Saxon and Kenzie in fall. This old fur has energy. Panel 2. I'm not sure I still love the type treatment I did for Liam's yawn here, but it does the job of letting you know that at least Liam's tired, if not all of them. Kenzie is stepping on and over that protruding root, and way in the background, Saxon is looking around and perhaps not paying close enough attention. Page 22, panels 1 through 3. And Saxon trips on that root, falls, and opens up where the snow has drifted over some hole in the ground. In my original outline, I had the act that opened the drift to be Saxon planting his sword in the snow. But for whatever reason, I changed it to this, and I actually prefer the face plant. I knew from the start of the issue that I wanted to break the patrol into two smaller parties, with Liam and Kellenaw able to be alone for the mentor-mentee relationship to reach full potential, and also to put Saxon, Kenzie, the normal pair, together with a third leaving room for someone to possibly become a third wheel, but that's talk for later issues. Page 23. Another splash page establishing the space and scale, and ultimately the danger. From the reader's perspective, the only mice we see are Kellenaw and Liam. We have no idea if the others survived or if Liam will fall too. It was a literal cliffhanger to end the issue on. Pinup by Jeff Darrow. When I asked Jeff if he'd do a pinup, he wanted to know if the mice ever ride other animals. I think he might have suggested a Yila monster. I mentioned hares, something I figured I might do at some point, but honestly, I didn't have that in any of the outlines for winter at that point. He sent me this gorgeous piece of a mouse riding a hare. Like a lot of Jeff's pieces, it was inked on vellum, which has a nice frosty quality to do it. I considered publishing it uncolored the way he sent it to me, but I ultimately decided to color it myself for publication. And that's the first issue of Mouse Guard Winter 1152. It has been collected in a hardcover and published by Archaea. If you've enjoyed this commentary, please leave comments in the section below, click like, let me know what I didn't answer for you in this issue, and subscribe for updates when I add more Mouse Guard commentary. 
Thanks for listening.